Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. We appreciate your time today. Um, to move right into our Tulsa County update, today we're, we are reporting an additional 117 Tulsa County residents who have tested positive for COVID-19. Brings us to a cumulative total of, of 12,831 people who have tested positive since the outbreak began. Good news is that of those, 11,224 have recovered, but there are currently 1,479 confirmed active cases of COVID-19 here in Tulsa County. The sad news that we get to every week is that since our last press conference last Thursday, five more Tulsa County residents have died from COVID-19, bringing the total to 128 lives lost through this pandemic. You know, we're constantly saying keep these, um, these individuals and their family in your prayers and your thoughts. And let's continue to do that. The more we support each other, the more we'll be able to get through this. So um, talking about data trends, I'd like to provide an overview, overview from our data team that covers the week of August 16th through the 22nd. We saw a modest decrease in cases compared to the previous week. And as you recall, the previous week we saw a decrease as well. That de decrease was 5.63%. Uh, let's just keep this um, decrease going. It's definitely the direction that we want to see. Um, largest increase in cases are within age groups of 5 to 17, with the growth of over 41% in that demographic. The age group with the most cases continues to be the 18 to 35 group that we've, we've talked about in the past and also, again, followed by a 36 to 49 year old age group. 46.1% of all cases are in the ages 35 and younger, and only 12% um, are cases in the age, age group 65 and older. Within the high risk settings after long-term care and nursing homes, schools had the second most number of associated cases. Some good news, this is the first time, of course, in weeks that we continue to see um, no hospitalization in that zero to four age group. And, and frankly, the first time in the five to 17 age group as well. So that is good news and let's continue to keep those demographics safe. 21.4% of all hospitalizations are those in 85, in the 35 years of age and younger. Uh, City of Tulsa represents about 65% of all cases in Tulsa County. For the portion of Broken Arrow within Tulsa County, cases represent about 14% of all cases. And for the portion of Bixby that's in Tulsa County, they represent about 5% of all the reported cases in, in, in our county. And all other municipalities within our county has less than 5% of our, of our cases. Um, as many of you know, the White House Coronavirus Task Force has prepared a state report with public health recommendations. The Oklahoma State Department of Health provided this document to THD this week, and I've shared it with City of Tulsa and with Tulsa County. I've been asked, of course, what does this mean for Tulsa County? I can tell you that as a county, we have implemented many of the measures that you might see in this report. However, basically some of them are really outside our scope of, of control. What I can encourage is following the three W's, wear your mask, wash your hands, watch your distance. And this applies, of course, to everyone at all times when they're out in the public. Uh, just yesterday, um, me and my team visited with the uh, members of the Maricopa County Public Health Department in Phoenix, Arizona. And they were able to document that 14 days following a countywide mask mandate, their cases started to decline. They actually said that that was the number one thing they did to mitigate spread and to flatten the curve in, in Maricopa County. I absolutely recommend that Tulsa County do the same. I have seen growing evidence of the effects of cities with mask mandates versus cities without. And the data shows that cases are slowing in cities with mask mandate. And together as a county, we can, we can all do this. We need to... We need all of our municipalities here in Tulsa County in unison to agree to do this as well, to keep their, their community safe, to make sure that we're all going in, in one direction when it comes to this response. We support Tulsa County restaurant owners and managers um, who have also made inside dining modifications that have expanded outside dining. You know, we really appreciate Tulsa County retail owners and personal service businesses who have made modifications to protect employees and customers. I mean. We've really, people have been forced to create a COVID business model. They've done a really nice job of serving the public and keeping the public safe. Our food protection services continues to provide feedback to, to your business's health and safety plans and can answer any questions that you might have regarding your specific facility. We are glad to see signage on the doors of a restaurant that encourages diners to wear a mask when not eating to protect other diners and staff. But we also want to make sure you're looking at the back of your house procedures and what your employees are doing when they're not out in the dining room to make sure that they continue to follow the three W's to keep everyone safe. 
what we know about this virus is that prolonged contact is where we see the most spread. And when employees are working closely with each other, we want to make sure modifications are in place to keep them safe and keep them healthy. We know people still want to live their lives and come together to celebrate occasions. We just ask together, take together safely, smaller numbers if possible. What that looks like is gathering in smaller groups, meeting outside as much as possible, wearing a mask, washing your hands frequently, and watching your distance. Those who are, who, those who are particularly at risk for severe complications should participate virtually. We will continue to follow trends, and if we see repeat outbreaks and gatherings, we will recommend to municipalities um, about issuing an event size mandate. At this juncture, we don't feel that's needed, but if, if we start to see a, a change in a, of the curve, it's something that we will definitely discuss with city leaders. I said this many times before, and it's worth repeating. After attending a large gathering, we recommend to get tested five to seven days following that exposure and stay home and away from vulnerable populations while you're awaiting your test results. If you want to be tested, of course, Tulsa Health Department can do that for you without a charge. Um, and so at this juncture, we're able to, to schedule same day or next day appointments. And of course, if you do want one, that number to call is 918-582-9355. If you are exposed to a known case and you test negative, it's still important to stay home for the full duration of your 14-day quarantine as the virus, has, as we've all said many times before, can develop any time from two to 14 days after exposure. Uh, we continue to get questions about contact tracing and we continue um, to do that. We, we do case notification, contact tracing, and risk assessment for every positive COVID-19 case amongst Tulsa County residents. We work very closely with the schools as we do this as well. This team includes bilingual professionals to ensure they are meeting the need for non-English speaking individuals we contact. We have staff who speak Spanish, Burmese, and Zomi to meet the needs of our largest non-English speaking communities. Tulsa Health Department also has the ability to use a language line for translation services as needed. Contact tracing, of course, we've talked about this many times, but it's a standard public health tool, one that we've been using for years and years to mitigate spread of disease. Please help us by being forthcoming with your responses to our contact tracers when identifying exposures. Withholding information could possibly jeopardize others' safety. There's nothing wrong, there's no wrong answers here. You won't be in trouble. We just ask for you to help us to help others. One of the roles that we play in this response is providing local data. We've been accessible and transparent from the beginning. We will continue to do that. We work with businesses to help them stay open. We, last thing we want to see is businesses shut down again. Our liaison officer has been doing an excellent job answering emails and phone calls with questions about recommendations for youth sports, local public and private schools, universities, local events and venues, restaurants, community organizations and faith groups that have all requested more and more information. And we appreciate them reaching out. We appreciate having a consistency in the messages and the consistency in response to, to safety guidelines. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us with your questions. And we are happy to review any health and safety plans that you have. I think our staff have actually gotten quite good at it and um, can give you the, the recommendations you need to function in a safe manner to keep everyone that, that comes in contact with your facility safe. Um, you know, it's been an incredibly long year. Uh, we've all had to deal with, with the impact and the burden of COVID-19. And in this, in this response, frankly, we've seen the best of human nature and the worst of human nature. It's important that, that we, instead of fighting each other, we need to fight this virus and we need to stay together, come together, and continue to be united so that we can beat this virus down and we are no longer in COVID era. So thank you for your time today. At this juncture, I'd like to introduce Mayor Bynum. Thank you very much, Dr. Dart. Um, you know, I've had a lot of questions at the city about the White House reports. Um, and uh, I think as you just heard from Dr. Dart, uh, he has been visiting with myself, my team in the mayor's office, and a working group of city councilors every single week uh, to talk about issues that are on the ground right now but then also uh, looking at outside recommendations such as these White House reports and uh, anything that we ought to be doing. And I think when you look at those reports, as he says, uh, th there are a lot of things that are recommended in there that we're already doing. 
uh, the, the outstanding things that you don't see in place right now uh, would be uh, event size limitations, limitations on gatherings. And uh, again, as you just heard Dr. Dart say, he doesn't believe based on the data on the ground here that that is needed. But uh, if it is, uh, then we will act on that. Uh, also, you know, the, the other big recommendation that they have in there uh, that we don't have in places around restaurants and bars. And uh, we've talked with Dr. Dart a lot about that recommendation in particular. And his concern with that is that that isn't a recommendation that the White House is making just for Tulsa. Uh, that is any area that's in a red zone. Here's just a list of things that you should do. And when we look at the actual contact tracing data here in Tulsa on what's causing the spread, restaurants and bars are not causing the spread right now. And, and I think that's the point of Dr. Dart's comment just a moment ago uh, about the, the effective measures that uh, our responsible uh, restaurant and bar operators here in Tulsa have put in place. Uh, that's not to say that every single one of them has been responsible, but most of them have. Uh, and because of that, uh, they are not one of the leading causes of spread here in Tulsa like you might see in other cities that would be characterized as red zones around the country. Um, so we'll continue to monitor this uh, as we have from the beginning. Any of the orders uh, that we've put in place, whether it's my executive orders or the mask ordinance put in place uh, jointly with the city council, we've always done that based on what we've heard from our local experts here in Tulsa at the Tulsa Health Department and in our health systems here in Tulsa. Uh, of course, we're always listening to and getting feedback from other groups around the state and around the country. Uh, but when it comes down to it, when we decide what's best for Tulsa, uh, we're talking with the Tulsa Health Department and our hospitals and we'll continue to do that. Um, I told you last week uh, about uh, a, a new program that we have uh, been made available for city employees because we want to make sure as school goes back into session, especially with virtual school in place, we want to make sure that uh, our employees on our team at the city of Tulsa uh, who may not have uh, daytime uh, child care options do. And so we created a uh, student support camp program thanks to the team at uh, the Tulsa Parks Department uh, that allows uh, employees to send their kids to a camp. The kids are kept in pods of about 10 and they have an adult uh, supervisor for the day, Wi-Fi access so that they can do all their virtual learning in groups in a safe environment. Uh, we've had that available for city employees. The really good news is that we have enough capacity. We can open that up uh, for the public at this point. Uh, and so if folks are interested in enrolling uh, the, their kids in this program, they can go to TulsaParks.org uh, and sign up. Uh, I want to be, again, <laughs> reiterate and be very clear. Uh, these are not teachers that are in the room with kids, uh, but they are adult supervisors uh, and aides. We also need more of those uh, to help with this, both uh, for the kids of just everyday Tulsans, but also uh, for our team at the city. And uh, I always get questions during this about what can we do to help our first responders. This is a great one that you can do uh, to help your first responders so they can be focused on doing their job uh, and keeping Tulsa safe instead of worrying about where their kid is going to spend their day. Uh, and so if you'd like to help out with that and be paid for it, uh, you can sign up or give us a call, the Tulsa Parks Department at 918-596-7275. These are temporary positions and they pay 12 bucks an hour and they will go, everybody goes through a background check and this is gonna go into uh, at least December. Um, of course, just in keeping with the theme of 2020, uh, we're now going to start dealing with hurricanes as well. So that's pretty much one of the only things on the list that we haven't had to deal with this year. Uh, I'm really grateful that we have uh, our team at the city of Tulsa and the Tulsa Police Department, Tulsa Fire Department, 
are, are, are being deployed uh, to go assist our neighbors in neighboring states. And to share more about that and the countywide effort on this, I'd like to introduce the director of the Tulsa Area Emergency Management Agency, Joe Kralichek. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, in anticipation of landfall of Hurricane Laura, the state of Louisiana activated the Emergency Management Assistance Compact between the states and requested assistance from the state of Oklahoma. In response uh, yesterday, resources from the Tulsa Urban Search and Rescue Team consisting of 38 firefighters and equipment left uh, to assist with hurricane operations in southwestern Louisiana, and they have arrived today. Uh, this is going to be under the coordination and assistance with the Oklahoma State Department of Emergency Management, and we're, we're appreciative of their efforts down there. Uh, today, the state of Louisiana requested a helicopter search and rescue teams, and Tulsa is going to be answering that call as well with supportive teams from Tulsa Fire. Tulsa Police IMT is on site at the Baton Rouge EOC, and they are assisting with coordination of evacuee transport and shelter operations, and they will be helping rehome those individuals once the hurricane has passed. Um, I want to reiterate that while our thoughts and prayers are with those that are being impacted by the hurricane, that this is in no way going to impact our readiness or ability locally to respond to any potential disasters such as storms, floods, or anything else that Mother Nature may throw at us. And the team is in regular communications with our teams down in the area, and we look forward to their safe return. Thank you. The question was my high school football will start very soon and do we have any guidance for teams or fans and um, definitely the, if you're if you're going to have a, a football game you really need to limit um, occupancy in the stands to no more than 25 percent so you can be assured um, of what normal occupancy is so you can be assured of, of the ability to watch the three w's um, and really with uh, with with the teams themselves I mean, it's going to be really difficult because with the physical nature um, of football people are hitting each other usually when they're when people get hit hard of course, there's um, saliva usually expelled, so it's a risk. So it's important that, that they be as safe as possible on the field. Um, you know, we can't, they can't wear masks. They can't <laughs> watch their distance. Um, but they really have to be pay attention to um, hygiene on the sidelines as well, with, whether it be hand sanitizer or hand washing stations, so that, that they, they hopefully will be part of stopping, stopping spread as opposed to um, furthering uh, spread. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. So the question was around what's the main causes of spread, and of course, long-term care. Is, you know, we've we've had cases in long-term care really since the the beginning, and and you know, it's a it's a closed environment. I think the the long-term care facilities have done a great job um, with with um, with implementing infection control protocol. But it's you know, this is an opportunistic virus, and any opportunity it's got it has to hitchhike from one person to the next is going to take advantage of. So we, we really want them to continue to, um, to follow their infection control protocol. If they hadn't, we'd be seeing much worse evidence of, of spread in these facilities. So they are doing a really nice job. But like I say, this is a, a highly efficient transmitting virus that, that takes, a, a, if you give a slight opportunity, it's going to transmit. And with schools, the same thing. You know, we've um, really, really asking the schools, and schools are trying very hard to do wherever they can, I think, to, to protect faculty, students, and, and staff. And, and they're going to be in the classroom. Um, they're trying to create, uh, change their, their footprint in, in their infrastructure to assure they can follow the three W's around distance and masking and, and washing hands. And, and as I say, you know, we, we have these recommendations, but they're not perfect. So it's important that, that as much as we can, we really stick to those recommendations. That the more we do, the more um, mitigation we'll, we'll see happen. So 
so the question about the difference between the, the state's version of red zone and, and the, and the uh, White House documents version of red zone, and I think that's part of really what is adding to that confusion and what recommendation you follow, because right now the, the, the state's alert system has us in an orange level, whereas the, the feds have us in, in, in a red level. And frankly, that's one of the reasons why we pay such close attention to the, the, uh, lo the local data and the data that we, we manage on the ground. Because, you know, it, it's still the state and, and, and federal government, I mean, they're, they're a support system, but we have, to, we have to act based on what we see here. And the data really helps, guides us on, on what to do here and informs our strategy here, and we follow the data extremely closely. So regardless of, of these, these alert zones, you know, we're going to follow the data here. And as I said earlier, if the data um, tells us we need to do something differently, we'll do something differently to, to prevent mitigation, mitigation stop spread. Now, does that mean we, we, we follow everything that, that comes down from different levels of government? No. I think the important level to really pay attention to is our local leaders, the data here on the local level, and making the right decisions based on the data that we, that we um, collect and, and uh, analyze. You know, they, they look at all, all the state's data, so it's how you present it. So, and the, the question is, where the CDC getting their data? And they, they get it from the states. And so the question is, is why the difference? Uh, and in all honesty, that's a question that you need to ask the state. And I, I'm, I'm not evading the question. It's just it's not, it's not our alert system, so. So we, and so the question about, uh, about the hospital data and, and how often we get it, we, you know, we, we have access to it every day. You know, it's just, it's just how you interpret it and really how you use it because, I mean, they're interpreting what it means. I mean, it, it is what it is, but it's, it's how you use it is what matters. And, and if you want to have an alert system, you know, we said before that it, and I'm glad the state's doing it. I think that's great because it's, it's a more valid reflection of what we're seeing. If you use regional data, um, then we at least know what the, what the capacity for hospitalization is here in our region. If we use statewide data, the capacity here is almost irrelevant when, when you're talking about we're okay because there might be open beds some, in some other part of the state. So it's important that we look from a regional perspective. That's what affects us locally, and that's what we're talking about capacity and capability of serving patients in, in our region. So you know, we, we have the data. It's, we try and interpret it in, in a way that makes the most sense. And using a regional format will allow us to do that and to communicate the proper information to local leaders and to the public as well. On the CDC and confusion, uh, they recommended earlier this week that you do not get tested if you've been exposed or aren't showing symptoms. Are you still following the old, if you are exposed, you'll get tested anyway? So the question is about the new recommendation that came out Monday about not testing asymptomatic people who've been exposed. And the good thing about that recommendation is that in it, it says, but still follow the recommendation of your, your provider or your, your local public health, state and local public health systems. We will continue to recommend that if you're exposed, whether asymptomatic or not, you be tested five to seven days after that exposure. You know, it's important that we, that we detect um, those who can transmit. And because that's how we stop spread. And if we don't do that, the spread will, will be unmitigated. So we're going to continue to follow that, the recommendation of exp you're exposed, you be tested, and um, until we, we grind this virus into the dust. You know, and, and Corey, I have to provide the question about how many plans have we, have we reviewed. And frankly, I don't know. I've got staff <laughs> that know. And actually, they, they, they actually gave an update on Monday, but I was on a different call, so I wasn't in the room. So, but I can find that out for you and get that back to you. They've, I think um, they're doing a really nice job. You know, we're given originally two weeks once we received the plan to get information out. We're trying to do it the same week. And so we, we, most plans have been reviewed. I think we have uh, maybe only two or three in the queue, which... Of course, it could change five minutes from now, but 
um, they, they, it's like, you know how this, you, you, you decide what you want to do as far as keeping people safe. You, and you um, develop a template, and then you just follow the guidelines, and pretty soon you, you get really good at knowing um, what guideline is, is will fit specific the footprint of a business that, that's for a safety plan and, and hopefully make, make recommendations that's specific to that, um, that facility that aren't general. Um, the question about are flu shots available and not yet. Um, we're actually working on our plan. Uh, and, and we do this every year and this time every year. We have our orders in to receive the vaccine and hoping to start ad actually administering um, flu vaccine in October. Uh, we've discussed that. I believe Oklahoma City did do that. Um, we've talked about that, but to date, you know, the, the recommendation from the health department has been that uh, you don't want to be putting in restrictions on businesses that adversely impact them if those businesses aren't a, a, a significant contributor to the spread of the virus in our community. And so early on in early going of the pandemic, when we didn't have local data to know what would be causing the spread. We had to take action based on national best practices, but now we've got, you know, we're going on five to six months of localized data, and that allows the Tulsa Health Department to make recommendations to policymakers like myself and the city council, hopefully my neighbors in other states as well, or other cities uh, that allow us to make those decisions that really target those things that are causing spread. All right. I wanted to ask one more. I kind of wanted to ask you this on election night, but a lot of people have said that you are facing choices where no one's going to be happy one way or the other. How are you, how do you balance that moving forward, especially with the pandemic? Some people have gone asking for the face masks, that kind of thing. How do you balance that choice? Yeah, no, the question is about how it's been pointed out that uh, as mayor in this environment, I have to make decisions uh, where the the decision that I make isn't going to make anybody happy. Uh, the choices that are presented are sort of uh, lose-lose choices uh, from a popularity standpoint. Um, and that's accurate. I mean, the, the mask ordinance is a really good example of that. Uh, y you have a... a group of folks locally who felt like we didn't act soon enough, even though we acted when the Tulsa Health Department, our, our health care systems told us that we should act. Uh, and then there are others who say that we never should have acted at all. Uh, and my, my answer to that as far as what we're going to continue to do is that uh, going through this is not about popularity. It's about following the advice of the experts that we have and when we have the ability to follow that advice and follow through on it to do so and uh, i'm again really grateful that we have a city council that feels the same way and has proven that with their votes when they were you know seven of the nine up for re-election in a tough year uh, and passions are inflamed and yet they cast a very courageous vote, uh, to date the only city council in Tulsa County uh, to have the courage to do that. So uh, I, I'm going to continue to do that uh, as mayor. I've been very open that uh, this is my last term as mayor. Uh, I won't be doing, uh, won't be seeking a third. Uh, I'd also be shocked if you ever see my name on a ballot for anything. And so everything that I'm gonna do, whether it's in response to this or anything else over the next four years is solely going to be based on what I think is best uh, for my fellow Tulsans. And that's it. Well, I had seen the, the initial one that was leaked and didn't know that if it was a, a real, if it was a legit document or not. Uh, I'll tell you, the, I mean, the 
The real surprise for me was when I was in the meeting with Dr. Burks and she said, and this was on a Sunday, oh, hey, tomorrow we're going to issue the eighth one of these reports to come out to find out that, you know, that wasn't just a single solitary report, but that there had been seven already issued and an eighth one was coming out the next day. That was a surprise. Uh, I'm appreciative uh, that the state and the governor's office has started publishing those online so that, uh, in particular, the team at the Tulsa Health Department has access to these recommendations and can assess those recommendations based on the data on the ground moving forward. I mean, we've had a lot of discussion in particular around uh, the restaurants and bars and event limitations. A and on each of those, Dr. Dart's recommendation is, to us has been that that is that's a broad sweeping recommendation that may be applicable in some cities where uh, they're in the red zone, but it doesn't apply to the data that we see on the ground here. Uh, the other thing that he's brought up out of that report, which I uh, wholeheartedly agree with, is the need for a broader mask mandate than just uh, a, you know, a handful of cities around the state doing it. Uh, our hospitals here in Tulsa do not just serve people that live in the city of Tulsa. They serve people that live in this entire part of the state of Oklahoma. Uh, and uh, I think that when our first and foremost concern is protecting the capacity of those hospitals to save lives, uh, it shouldn't just be on the citizens of Tulsa to protect that capacity. Um, so I, I again, I, I would hope, and by the way, you know, I, I've said it before, I'll say it again. I recognize that the governor, he's got to weigh uh, uh, regulations that impact somebody that lives in a densely populated apartment building in Tulsa and somebody that lives by themselves on a 500 acre ranch in the Panhandle. At the same time, uh, the state and the governor earlier on in this pandemic did issue regulations that localized it to counties uh, that saw a spread. I believe it, his, his early order on takeout, which really didn't apply here because we we're already doing it, uh, but also to closure of uh, non-critical infrastructure businesses uh, in those counties that had evidence of spread, that was a really good way to break it out into those areas where it was applicable and not be uh, putting regulation, a regulatory burden on those areas that didn't uh, see or feel the presence of a threat yet. And so, uh, you know, that, that could be an option if uh, neighboring communities around here just won't do it, that's another person who could, uh, would be the governor through that kind of an action. But I feel like everything we're hearing from Dr. Dart is in the city of Tulsa, the city council and I, we're doing everything that, that we should be doing based on the health department's analysis of the data on the ground. Well, I really think that, uh, you know, the way I've put it, I feel like we're in the early stages of the third phase of this pandemic. Uh, the first one was when it was brand new uh, and we had to take aggressive action to slow the spread of it so that our healthcare system wouldn't collapse. Uh, the second wave of it or phase of it was uh, with the uh, state's reopening. And, you know, I thought we handled that very well for about four weeks and not so well for about six weeks and then I think recovered and recalibrated. And I said at the outset of that phase that we haven't really been through this before and we would have to navigate that as a community. Uh, and I think we learned a lot through that second phase. And now we're in this third phase when schools are starting to reopen. And, uh, you know, I had somebody, uh, a, a state official put it to me this way that, you know, this is like, having a 
a, a super spreader event every single day in almost every community around the state, around the state of Oklahoma. And that presents a tremendous amount of risk. Uh, and how the, each individual school handles that is going to determine what kind of an impact it has on our overall caseload. So uh, I think that right now we're in that third phase. I think we have a really good system set up at the city of Tulsa for interfacing with the Tulsa Health Department. Uh, I would say that the big lesson, if I were to be candid uh, uh, from phase two for me, is that we have to keep our hands on the steering wheel here in Tulsa. Uh, we can't rely on anybody else to be making the decisions for us. Uh, we've got to be focused on doing it here in Tulsa, working with the health department and with our health care system to manage it to the best of our ability here in Tulsa, something I thought we did very well in phase one. We realized we should have been doing a better job of it in phase two, and I think we are doing a good job of it now in phase three. All right. Thank you. A lot of time, you're, yeah, you're asking how has this changed search and rescue operations. A lot of times our search and rescue operations were already taking into account, you know, potential infectious diseases. And so, you know, we would, of course, already have personal protective equipment for all those responders working out in the field. Uh, yeah, so if anything, all this has done is, is reiterated the importance and need for the training and use of that PPE amongst our response community. Of course, in this type of situation, social distancing is, is not available. Uh, you, you can't really social distance from somebody you're trying to save. And so we do have protocols in place for whenever those individuals return. We'll be working with the fire department and the police department to make sure that anybody who was out in the field doing search and rescue, when they come back, will go through a period of isolation and testing just to make sure that they're safe before they're released back into the general community. Thank you.